Namaste all. New day, new verses as we continue on into Matthew. Today we are doing verses 47 through 56. Jesus betrayed and arrested. And there is a lot I wanted to dig into here, so let's get into it. Here we go. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him a kiss. Jesus said, My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. The, then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this, all ha uh, this is all happening to fulfill the word of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, the disciples deserted him and fled. I, I love the fact that we're seeing that Jesus is like the word quoting the word saying, yeah, you're going to bail. No, we never would. You will. But it's going to happen because scriptures are designing this. Even the way he's being treated, scriptures say this would happen. The suffering servant. So many examples of where God would come and die for us, setting it right. All of the new, all of the Old Testament pointing to the New Testament. All of the nature, the structures, the forms, all of it done to say, hey, this is God working in it. This is God moving through the difficulty. This is God seeing it, knowing the struggles, knowing the human condition more intimately than we do. Because he's seen it through all time. We just see it through our own eyes and those around us. And he's seen this tendency toward hypocrisy, towards getting lost, towards stumbling, toward falling. He knows how fickle our heart is. That's why Jeremiah and Ezekiel both talk of it greatly. Because our hearts need to be devoted to him. Devoted to the kind of love he offers. And when I say the kind of love he offers, I'm drawn to two sections in this verse. 52 and 50. Where Jesus says, my friend. To Judas, the one betraying him. He knows it's happening the way it's supposed to, and rather than hate Judas as so many of us do, he says, oh, well, you're still my friend. My love will always be offered to you. Will you accept it or not? That's your choice. It will always be offered. It's, he's a creation. I mean, we have this religious argument of, oh, well, they're just evil people. No, I mean, all people are evil. It, it's evil in the heart. It, it requires God moving in and fixing it. Because otherwise, we inevitably do, as to quote judges, what is right in our own eyes. Because we promote a life that has no king, rather than bowing to the one true king. Rather than bowing to Jesus, who shows this kind of love, to call him my friend. I mean, earlier in the text we say, the betrayer, Judas, the traitor, Judas, and Jesus is saying, my friend. Person whom I love, person who I am here for too. Do what you've come to do. Because God is sovereign over it, either way. God is greater than, either way. So even if this happens the way it seems to be playing out, God is bigger, either way. It's a place of trust. And then the next part that struck out to me, 52, put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will buy, die by the sword. Because then you're looking at Paul and like, okay, so what are we supposed to do? Well, Paul gives a perfect example, the sword, the sword of the Spirit. John picks this up in Revelation, that the sword is coming out of Jesus' mouth. We don't fight like the world does. We fight on our knees in prayer. We don't battle like the world does against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and spirits. We take our ground. We say this far, no farther. I'm not going to behave the way you do. I'm not going to react or respond the way you do. I am going to love. I am going to turn my existence over so much so that I can look at the person who's stabbing me in the back in that moment and say, my friend, do what you've come to do. God will see to it. I say, well, that's faith. It's way out of that. I mean, how could anyone have that kind of faith? On their own? It is impossible. Jesus literally says that himself. 
with God, all things are possible. With Him, in surrendering to Him, in trusting Him, in laying it down before Him, our thoughts, our forms, our desires, everything about us. I mean, when Jesus said, Lord said that God is spirit, that the Father is spirit and must be worshipped in spirit, must be talked to in spirit, must be in that kind of communication. Everything has to be left to fall aside. Our egos, our fears, our stupidities, our moments of letting ourselves waste away to pain and darkness and resentment and anger and hate and putting down the behavior that has been repetitious of Cain and Abel since. In you know, one of the other Gospels, we, we find out that the person who cuts off the sword is Peter, and that Jesus puts it back on. And I love the fact that even when there's this celebrity for the Lord that causes us to do something stupid, the Lord will fix it and give us a lesson. It may be one that stings, it may be one that kind of causes our ego to be a bit bruised. But I would ask you this question, why are you having an ego with God? Why are you telling the I am what he gets to do? I mean, Philippians itself says that we're supposed to pray, worry about nothing, pray about everything, tell God what you need. And not one of those, well, I need a Lexus, I need a Prius, I need $10 million in my bank account. That's remarkably superficial. It's like, well, if you have money, no, I grew up in poverty. I know what it is like to have to rub together two dimes and find a quarter. I know what that's like. It sucks. I also know that much like the believers in the wilderness, much like Israel in Bar Ba in Numbers, we have to be willing to say, you know what? God knows I don't. God is taking care of it, so I will not worry. We have to get to a place of trust where it is not about superficial things. Man does not really live on bread alone, and yet we find ourselves, generation after generation, being more worried about the bread in our stomach than the ones that we're truly eating from, the Deuteronomy kind of bread. We find ourselves so busy crapping on each other and yelling at each other for not being, oh, you don't wear this flag, you don't wear that color, you're not my tribe, you're not my faction. We're not called to live like that. We're called to move through the insanity of tribalism and petty behavior and say God loves everyone. I mean, do we not believe John 3.16 when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, if we really do believe that, shouldn't our lives be welcoming everyone in to, as Paul says, work so that people know that we are not against them? It's like... Well, well, how are you supposed to do that? How do you do that in the middle between dealing with a person who's lost in evil and struggle and is still love? By love. You're not loving the sin. You're loving the broken-hearted person who needs to be lifted up. They need to be pointed to. We all need to be looking at the one true Son of God who has the authority to say both your sins are forgiven and get up and walk. And who is so loving that in the face of the guy literally betraying him, kissing him on the cheek to have him turned over and crucified, he says, my friend. Well, what if it's a translation error? You can't screw that one up, mate. You cannot get my friend off of something else because the two ideas rarely go hand in hand in language. Friend and enemy. Almost always they're inverse. It is this question of, do we really want to love like Jesus does? And if we're not willing to love like Jesus does, then we may, must admit that we have no interest in serving the one true God. I mean, that may seem a little bit tactless and blunt. But this is a shit or get off the pot kind of moment here. It's a moment where you need to choose, all of us need to actively choose, which are we going to hold on to? Us, ourselves, our pain... Our egos, our heartbreak, our struggles, our missed decisions, our what-ifs? Or are we going to hold to the one who sees, the one who knows, the one who sets it right? I mean, I know I keep saying that is his name, Jaira, who sees to it, who sees to it, who sees to it, but I'm trying to let it truly dig in as much as it sank in me. If we truly believe that God is over it, that God will see to it, then he'll make a way through all of it. We simply need to love. 
And there's another example in John, or potentially in Luke, the Gospel, they're all beautiful together. And it says, how can you, no, it's in 1 John, 1 John 4. How can you hate your fellow creation and say you love God? For how can you love the God you cannot see if you cannot love the person you do see? That's it. That's the core of it. That's the struggle. That's the part that is not the easiest, is impossible of our own strength. And with God is how we get to live. The kind of mercy and love that sees the person. Why we so often pray, Lord, give me eyes to see and ears to hear, so that we can truly look at the person, see them, and love them the way God loves us. I mean, Jesus himself says the greatest form of love you can show is to die for your friend, to die in their place. If you're following him, you know where you're going. And if you, in the parable where Jesus says, which one is my neighbor, you know, the Pharisee asking Jesus, okay, who's my neighbor? And gives the parable of the Samaritan being the neighbor who went over and helped out. Is that not what we should be doing? Is that not how we should be living? Is that not the grace that we should show toward others? Ones that try to see them, their struggles, their trials. Wanting to understand why they got the decision that they did, rather than condemning them wholeheartedly. You know, we've got this tendency, especially I grew up in the 90s, of, you know, don't judge someone until you walk a mile in their shoes. When did that stop being a thing? Especially when we're told, judge not, lest ye be judged, to go the King James route. Or if, the, if you do not forgive other sins, the Lord will for not forgive your sins. Why have we not taken a moment to say, oh, wait a minute, um, maybe I should see this person the way God does. Maybe I should see their trials, their struggles, their heartaches, their pains, their difficulties, their hopes, their dreams. Maybe I should see them before I throw them out because they're different. Before I cast them aside because they're other. Maybe I should love the way he loves rather than adding to the damnation and the pain that have been going on since Cain and Abel. It's like, well, you're calling evil good and good evil. No, no, not at all. Not at all. These are two very different ideas here. I'm saying see the person. Evil is evil. And only God is good. So why don't we take a moment to see the person? Because Jesus said himself that he did not come into this world to condemn it, but to save it. So why is the body acting in condemnation? Why are churches not looking like hospitals? Why are those who say, I serve the great I am, casting others aside because they're not from the same tribe? I mean, it's, be it's repeating the same foolish error that is seen in Israel, in the Old Testament, in the Catholic Church, in the New Testament, er, in history. It's this repetitious cycle of playing the tribalism game. Rather than saying, well, I'm from the tribe of God. Well, does it mean you're black or white? Doesn't matter. Does it mean you're Protestant or Catholic? Doesn't matter. It means I chase after the one true God who loves me, died in my place, forgives my sins, and so I shall do the same. I shall love the way he loves. Remembering what Hosea 6.6 6 says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What is the point of piling up rams and goats and bulls and so many of the things that we do nowadays in the contemporary West? Going into church, singing praises for two hours, and then listening for an hour to the Word, and then going right back to doing it. No wonder God gets tired of it, because it's the same repetitious behavior. It's the same foolishness that is seen again and again and again. Rather than offer mercy, rather than offer kindness, rather than offer the the very fruits of the Spirit that God is growing in us, back to Him by loving others. We choose to say, oh, well, I got my dose of Christian crack. I can go back to what I was doing now. That's what it is. And those places, those dispensaries, if you will, will not always last forever. Those places where you can get, oh, I'm just going to get a quick fix of learning how not to be an asshole, and by Wednesday it's gone. Now, pardon the profanity on this one. I think it's time to get past, oh, you, you use bad language. Which is worse? To say that somebody is a lesser fool because they do not agree with you? Or to say damn when you stub your toe? I'm not saying either is good. 
I want to have a real conversation here. A real moment of saying, why don't we put down the Christian crack pipe and actually live the way God has us to live? Show the mercy God has shown us. Show the love God has shown us. And when, you know, to die for your friends. Oh, does that mean I'm going to jump on a grenade? Sometimes it's keeping your mouth shut and offering love when you're dealing with somebody who's losing their cool. Hearing them, not the words of their anger, but actually hearing them, their heartache, their pain. Sometimes it is literally taking up your cross and following him. And then when we correct each other, we do so in love. Not as one of these, oh, I'm just going to stand over here and correct you from afar. No, intimately. Intimate relationships saying, oh, that, that's what you're getting at. That's what you're saying. Because how can you judge somebody you don't know from Adam? To say the fact that we're not supposed to judge. But again, kind of getting back into this repeated cycle of what God has been saying forever. If you will turn from your sins to me and let me heal you, you will live. And that is a paraphrased quote from at least 15 books. All we have to do is let him be God and stop trying to do it ourselves. The moment we do that, the moment we try to chase after God so that we can truly live, we do. Not our own power. Paul says it was himself and quite true. We neither make nor save ourselves. He is the author. God is the author and finisher of our faith. We have these snippets, these verses that we turned into bumper stickers rather than taking a moment to actually say, wait, yeah, he is the author and finisher of my faith. That means I have to let him write it. That, that means I have to let him be the one to draw the pen. Well, does that mean that you're not involved at all? No. And now we get into the beautiful paradox of the kingdom, one of the many, being completely involved and not at all. Because the part of you that is completely involved is the part that came from him in the first place. And the part of you that is not involved at all is the part that doesn't really matter. The ego, the scars, the taking a moment, the pain. It's about distinction, set apart. Living holy. Not by piety or some kind of, well, I don't eat this kind of food, I don't mix these kind of fabrics, and I've never touched a dead body. That's wonderful if you're a Nazarite, um, if you're everybody else. And, I mean, there's a reason that Jesus calls out Peter and says, Do not call dirty what I have called clean. Well, inviting the Gentiles, the Goyim, people outside the body by blood. And if he does this again and again and again and again and again, always inviting the other, who's just saying, Well, there's got to be something different. There's surely... Surely there is love. Sh surely, surely there's something else out here that's real. And you have so many people in this generation wandering around, lost, asking what is real. And the group of people that should be showing it first and foremost, the body of Christ, are so busy infighting that we barely look at. We barely look different from the world because of our behavior. And how heartbreaking that is, not as just the church, but for our Abba. Our Abba who said, let me fix you. Because we've seen the old, you know, it's like, oh, God's, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means you look at the Old Testament where you see God's wrath, do not see anger and pain. Don't see like that kind of wrath. Don't see Zeus throwing lightning bolts. That's a little too Greek for a Hebrew God. It's the grief. It's the same grief that's seen in Exodus. The same grief that is seen all throughout the Bible where God is going, Stop this. I've held you to my soul. I've held you to my bosom. I've held you in the shadow of my wing, in the palm of my hand. Time and time again, year after year after year, event after event, trial after trial, century after century, I have held you and you will not look at me. Why won't you look me in the face? Why won't you look me in the eye? Why are you scared? Why are you terrified of me? The response so often is, well, because God gets angry. The response of the, th the, th the third servant with the talents. Well, I knew you were a harsh man. If that's the kind of relationship you're thinking, then of course you're going to be scared. Forgetting entirely what John says. 
in first or in first John, perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And if there is fear, then it is from a life that is not fully cultivated in love. First John 4, go read. It's a blast. This is the God whom we serve. Who says, put down your ego. Put down your BS. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Well, what is the two? What is it? Picking up your cross is putting down the ego. Picking up your cross is putting down the places where, well, I want justice to win out because that guy screwed me and I want to screw him back. Is not justice the Lord's to mitigate? Is vengeance his not to be met out? We serve a God of all creation, the God of all creation. Why do we refuse to believe? Why do we refuse to intimately take the word into our hearts? and say he is good and merciful and loving and true and he will never let me go. (laughs) I know why. And it's why I pray, Lord, open our eyes to see and open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive before it is too late. Because Jesus, quoting Isaiah, who was quoting the word made flesh before he arrived as Jesus, the word quoting the word, They have had their hearts hardened and their eyes blinded so they and their ears deafened so they cannot see so they will not turn to me and be healed and it makes me think as we wrap up here for continuing on tomorrow with verses 57 through 68 i want to leave you with this egypt exodus 10 plagues the first five pharaoh hardened his own heart. The first five, Pharaoh saw the power of God, saw what was wanted. Freedom, mercy, kindness, real deliverance. And he hardened his heart. He set up yours to God, to Moses, to the people of Israel. Or in biblical, he said, I will not let your people go. Get out. First five times, they hardened their own hearts. The next five, God hardened Pharaoh's heart because he was going to use him. He said, fine, if you don't want to do it my way, if after time and time again I've said, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way, if you want to keep fighting me, fine. I'm going to use you for my glory and I'm going to hand you over to the actions of your own consequence, the consequences of your own actions. Because the thing that killed Pharaoh, the thing that cost him his firstborn, the thing that cost all of Egypt such pain and brought such covering for the Israelites, is that he refused. His stubborn heart cost him his son. His stubborn wrath cost him his crown, his life, and his kingdom. And, historically speaking, it is one of the moments where... Egypt entered a dark age where their kingdom fell. Go look at the archaeological record. The timeline, the random numbers that we have signed don't line up very well. But the archaeological record does. The actual what's pulled out of the earth shows. Yeah. What cost Pharaoh is that instead of taking a moment of humility and saying, wow, this really is the one true God who has power over everything, every God in Egypt over absolutely everything, he lets the hate, he lets the hurt, and he lets the wrath of thinking that he's better take over him. He charges down into the Sea of Reeds where the people of Israel are making their way out. And then God lets it over. As he said, he would protect the people of Israel as they passed through the water. He never said he'd protect the Egyptians. And they charged in, thinking they would be fine. Missing again that God is in control of all of it. God is sovereign over all of it. And in the end, the waters overtook them. And they were washed away, dead. Because rather than take a moment and say, You know what, God? I haven't a clue. You do, though. You know what you're doing, God. Teach me. Learn me so I can do it. So I can live what I believe. 
same behavior that was in the hearts of Pharaoh is seen in the hearts of those in, in Israel in the wilderness. A place of, well, I know you're God, but I'm greater than you. You're the creation, not the creator. Yeah, but I'm going to tell God what to do. And I'm going to complain about the fact that he's taken care of me my entire life. Like any parent with an ungrateful child will say, it's difficult. It's tiring. It is interesting, though. Just for a moment here. As I close for the day. The idea that God gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. If you've ever lost anyone, especially a parent who has lost a child, you know the agony that causes. You know the pain that's there. And that is the kind of pain God endured. Past tense. Endured. So that we would be free. So that we could come to Him. Constantly trading pain for pain. Making a way. Drawing out saving his remnant and bearing their pain. By his stripes, we are healed. He was crushed for our iniquities. Do we truly believe it? If we don't, we need to be on our knees before him, asking him to get it right in us so that we can be right with him in true relationship. Because it won't last forever. In the end, the time will come where a choice has to be made. You know, this question of, are you for my tribe? Are you for their tribe? You see in Joshua, the angel of the Lord, neither. I am for the Lord. And I think it's about time that the Christian body, the body of Christ, the church, in all of its little childish-ass subgroups and subdenominations, all those who actually believe that Jesus is the one true Son of God, king over it, and want to worship him with all they are, all the heart in them, all the being in them, because Jesus is worthy to be praised. That's the kind of love we need to be living. Love that sets free. Really free. So when the trials and the struggles and the factionalism of this world come, we do not say, well, I'm not for their tribe, or I'm not their tribe, or I am their tribe. We say, neither. I am for the Lord. I don't care about this mandate or that mandate. I am for the Lord. I do not care about this faction or that faction. I am for the Lord. I do not care about the childish behavior that would result in trying to kill each other. I am for the Lord. And I will stand resolute saying, turn away from doing evil. Turn to the one, the only one, who is good. So that you may truly live. As you embrace the sacrifice of his blood over you. Making you a new creation, just as he promised. I'll see you guys tomorrow as we go over verses 57 through 68, Jesus before the council. May his favor be upon you. Take to heart that you are loved. That no matter what you did, done, or will do, he already knows. He already died for you. So let go of the past and embrace the love that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll see you then.